talking about the presidential inflation process. You think it's too long, it's too expensive, you, you don't have a good sense of what the candidates are about, and it's, it's too hard for you to decide. The quality of the candidates is often swayed by the media. I mean, they can make you think that somebody's better or worse than they really are. So I think if we change the current process, we could shorten the length of time, we could make it a lot cheaper, we could, we could get people more involved in knowing what the candidates are about, and it'd be a, a lot simpler process. My proposal would be to first have each candidate videotape, well not videotape, but produce in a mini-series, which would give you their life and their career all in a story. And you would sit and watch it, maybe a five-night mini-series on each candidate. And it would be at the beginning of the TV series when all the new shows come out, so you'd be really pumped up to watch these shows. Um, then, at the end of the series, at the end of the television season, they can show the summer reruns, and if you didn't miss watch it the first time, you could catch it on the reruns. Then they come out with the video version, you could go at home, go home and play the, the video, so that everyone would be familiar with the candidates, they sort of know them personally by watching videos. Um, then, uh, in addition to the miniseries series, you could have 977 number that you would dial up and there would be a recorded message of the candidate's platform. Everything you want to know about this candidate, you just dial up and you find out about it. If you don't like it, you dial somebody else's number. So you find a candidate you feel comfortable with. Okay, so once this process, let's say it starts in September when the new shows come out, you have a summer rerun, and you can dial 977 number all throughout the, the year. Then comes November. And it would just be a matter of turning on your TV to get the 900 number that you call to vote for the candidate of your choice. I mean, you wouldn't even have to leave home, okay? You don't have to stand in any long line, pull with all that stuff. You dial up, each candidate would have their own 900 number, and you'd be charged the minimum fee, maybe $5 for, uh, you know, making the call. And that fee could be used to finance the campaign or the video production or whatever. It would be wouldn't be a thing where the candidate with the most money would, would be the automatic winner because it would be equitable from the beginning. And then the cost of the 977 number would just pay for I mean, the 900 number would just pay for Have you ever been to a wedding that was one hour late on the hottest day in July in a church that wasn't air conditioned? The male organist comes parading through the middle of the church wearing a hot pink suit, which is too tight, <laughs> and then get to the organ. The music is sung off key. Then you get to the reception, and the bride and groom are about an hour late arriving to the reception. You go into the place, and the, the DJ is playing, playing some music that's blaring. I mean, it's just irritating to the ears. They forget to say grace before they start serving the food. Everyone starts eating without the grace. And then when you're called to the, t to the buffet line, they run out of food. <laughs> oh, I mean, this is a wedding that I hope you've never been in or that it was not of your own. But if that has happened to you, it was not a wedding that I planned because I am brown consultant. And my goal is to help the bride save money, save time, and have a beautiful wedding that she can just sit back, relax, and enjoy the day. And of course, if her guests come away feeling like, oh, what a wonderful event. The way that I help her save money is to first help her set her goals, to help her decide the size of the wedding, you know, how many people will she invite, how many people will be in the wedding, help her to decide uh, where, where, what's the setting? Will it be a church wedding? Will it be a wedding out in the park somewhere? What I do first is I get with the bride in an initial consultation, and I ha ask her to visualize. I ask her to think of the thoughts that she had when she was a little girl of walking down the aisle. I help. I ask her to. Well, actually, I play soft music and, and step her through the whole wedding process so she can see in her mind 
her whole wedding day. Can we write everything down? And she may have in mind that she's going to have uh, three limos, a horse-drawn carriage, and an airplane, a helicopter, escorted to the, <laughs> to the church. So what I have helped her do is bring her, her idea more in line with her pocketbook. So maybe she can't have three limos. Maybe she can't even afford one limo. So maybe we'll come up with an idea where she could get a, a relative who has a very nice car, a Cadillac or something, and maybe she could borrow that car. Or maybe she could do something unique like instead of just decorating the car after the, the reception, she could decorate it before on the way to the church. You know, any, anything that would make her wedding unique and might save her some money. I do all of the legwork looking for services uh, that, that she would need. I, you decide on the budget, and I, and I go out and I, I seek, actively seek, the services that will fit within her budget. Then, in order to help her save time, because planning a wedding, whether you have a month or a whole year to plan, you have to be organized and you have to be on a set schedule. So, I really like to start with the brides in the beginning, when they, when they have a fresh idea that they're getting married. And what I will do for them is set up a calendar of events. Six months, let's say, we want to make sure we select the church, we select the reception, we know who the photographer is going to be. And then what I do is I use the PC, put all of her calendar on the PC, and present her with a new calendar, update it on a you know, weekly basis, monthly basis. And as we get closer to the wedding, the calendar changes frequently. But I make sure that she's on schedule. That, she, that she's sticking to that plan. So when we get the time, time saved, the money saved, we've got this plan, and we, we, we've seen the wedding, we know what it's going to be like, the bride can relax because she's put her trust in me. I've actually become, you know, been working very close with her, and I've actually become a trusted friend. So that she knows on that day she has nothing to worry about. It. She can relax and enjoy the day. And she's taken all of, the, all of those things into consideration in planning so that her guests will enjoy the day. So that if it's going to be the hottest day in July, she's made sure that the church is air-conditioned. Or that if she's going to have 250 guests, that the caterers have prepared for 250 people. So all the planning, the legwork is done, she goes in and she relaxes and is taken care of. And another thing that I like, I, I, I stress, is that the people that you select for the wedding, that, that you're, they're your good friends, that they're people that are near and dear to you, and that they will make you feel comfortable, and that they will make the guests feel comfortable, because the first thing that they'll see will be your attendance. So, in conclusion, uh, um, I just want, want you to know that if you're planning a wedding, or if you're getting married yourself, or you know someone that's getting married, and they need help bringing all the pieces together, that my services are always available, that I can definitely help you save time, help you save money, which is most important, and pull off a wedding that's just a beautiful event that will be memorable and most enjoyable. <laughs>
church at 10 o'clock for a 12 o'clock wedding, and I had several items with me that I needed to take with me to uh, prepare the church for the wedding at 12. I had to get in there to set up the archway and make sure the bows were on the pews and all. But when I got to the church at 10, the church was locked. Uh, the sex tent, or the, the, the uh, janitor was supposed to be there at 8 o'clock. And here it was, 10, two hours to the wedding, and the church was locked. The first thing I did was, well, I banged on the doors and tried to, you know, see if there was anyone maybe in there asleep or something. I, you know, I just couldn't believe that I would be standing out here, the bride and groom would come, and all the guests would be there, and we wouldn't be able to get to church. I mean, that was my fear. Well, there were some concerns other than not being able to get in the church. I mean, we had planned all this time for a wedding, and bride and groom, you know, they had to get married, whether the church was open or not. I mean, that couldn't stop the show. I mean, after all, underlying the fact that they were going to have a wedding, they, they were in love, and they were anxious to consummate the, the <laughs> arrangement. <laughs> Um, my my needs were that we had a written contract, and you know I wanted to get paid, and I wanted to well, not mainly get paid, but I wanted to make sure that the wedding came off without a hitch, that it was smooth, and that you know I had uh, followed through with my end of the bargain. And of course, I didn't want to end up embarrassed. I mean, that's probably the worst thing that here I I said I could um, carry off this smooth, effective event, and first thing, no one can get in the church. I mean, that would really be disaster. <laughs> well, I had three solutions. I could break into the church, <laughs> thereby, you know, solving the solution rather quickly, but I thought that that wasn't a wise solution. Uh, my second choice was to look for the sex tent. Um, I had I had a, the name of the minister, but I thought that I didn't have the name of the, se the name and number of the sex tent, which was my mistake. I should have had that. So it was fruitless for me to even think about finding the sex tent because I didn't have any of the information on him. But I did have the minister's telephone number. So I thought that maybe the minister could send someone else down to open up the church doors in time. But I did have another problem with making the telephone call. Unfortunately, I left the house without my change purse, without my money. So I didn't even have a quarter to make a phone call, which complicated the, prob the uh, problem. So what I ended up doing was trying to find a nice person who would let me use their phone <laughs> for free. <laughs> <laughs> and I was successful in doing that. I called the minister and, and, and alarmed, you know, church is not open, please, and come on my way. And he was willing to do that. By the time I had gotten back to the church, the sexton who had gone to have breakfast with his aunt who lived off the street, you know, came back and let me in the church. And everything ended up very happy. The bride and groom were married, and I'm sure they got, got everything together. <laughs> Life. 
Whenever I see my baby smile, I think of how he may never have formed his lips in that fashion. Every time I hold him close, feeling his warmth, think of how his heart may never have pumped with red blood. Each and every day I thank God for giving him life through me and for keeping me strong, strong enough to keep the life inside, to let him live and grow, to let him be born a baby, to one day be a man, my son, I love him. The woman that wrote that poem had a tough decision to make whether or not to have an abortion, and she chose life chose to keep your life inside. This is not going to be a talk about whether or not we should have the choice to have an abortion. Everybody has a choice. We have free will. God gave us free will. We have the choice um, to go out here and drive 95 miles an hour on the freeway. If you, if you choose, you have that choice. You might take a risk in doing so, but you have the choice. I'm going to talk about reasons women give for abortion, uh, the types of abortion that are available today, but the main thing being the person that's inside that we are choosing life or death for. Why do you think some women choose to have an abortion? Anybody know? Economic reasons? Some are really forced into it by parents or the father of the baby. I admit that this is a graphic uh, depiction of abortion, but I submit to you that essentially, you know, you're, you're excising uh, a human being. These are reasons I say all have alternatives. Um, the death of the mother, though, is another issue all in, a, in and of itself, because I think that could be a whole topic that could be argued on separately. It's philosophical thing where you, you're thinking about the good, the greater good, is it greater to have a baby, sacrifice the mother, or is it greater to let the mother live who's already been a viable person in society? So I'm not even going to really de uh, direct my argument to the death of the mother. But rape, incest, granted, 
maybe that's the reason for the pregnancy, but even if you don't want the baby, the baby can still be born. Adoption is always an alternative. All of these, I think, are circumstantial reasons that circumstances change. Uh, ruined future, especially future, maybe if you look down the path, you may not see any, any future, but there are always ways that you can improve your future if you set your goals high enough, have some support systems. You don't always have to think of the future as a, as a dead end just because of having a child. Uh, inconvenience, that's a, a really bad reason because it shows that you're not taking the responsibility in the beginning, ending, ending up in that situation, and uh, it's a, a poor reason. Circumstances change the bottom line, and you have to be able to see farther along into the future. Birth control and lack of education are the two reasons that I have had the most difficulty with, because Abortion should not be used as a form of birth control. There are other methods before the baby is even formed that you can, you can choose. Types of abortion. Today there are three ma major types of abortion. <coughs> widely used is the suction method of abortion. In a such, uh, about 1.5 million abortions are performed uh, and in the United States. And suction, as I said, is the main, main one. The procedure that's used is basically they go in with a vacuum and they just remove the content. Um, usually after a suction abortion, they go back and look at the contents that were removed just to make sure that they've gotten everything. Um, it's always performed, all of these abortions are performed within the first trimester. They feel as though at that point the baby is not much of a baby. Uh, so it's okay to take them at that point. Or the argument also is that the baby could not live outside the mother at that time, so it's not much doesn't have much work at that time, so it's okay to go ahead and take the baby. Another type is the DNC. 30% of the abortions are DNC, which stands for dilation and uh, curtilage. What they do basically is they go in with um, a blade, a curved blade, and they scrape the contents of the womb and move the baby in that fashion. And, and also, in that case, they but also piece the parts back together. And at this point, at three months, the baby is sucking all the body parts of the hair. Uh, the heart is definitely beating. So they put back together the arms and legs and uh, just to make sure the baby all, was all removed. The third type is the saline abortion, which to me is one of the worst types of abortion because they actually they inject a saline solution into the, the uterus and the baby has to it has to be born like a normal delivery, and when it comes out, it's burned from the salt. The skin is actually burned, and in some cases, still a lot, born alive, and sometimes uh, the baby is, has been known to cry. Uh, these methods of abortion are risky for the mother, but more risky for the person inside. Um, you can argue personhood. Does, does this living being have a soul and all of that? That's really philosophical, theological, whether or not it has a soul. That's not really my concern. My concern is basically that there's life inside from day one. It's a wondrous uh, circumstance to set of events, of events that occurs from day one where the cells divide. You have a uh, immediate formation of a, a, a group of cells that are differentiating into bones and organs and skin. I mean, it's a magical process. So 
from day one. And I really don't see how it can be refuted that it's not right. Whether or not it's a person, you know, that's another argument, but definitely life inside. So, in conclusion, um, as, you, as you notice, I haven't mentioned Roe versus Wade at all, because I feel that that's insignificant. Uh, whether or not we have the choice for safe and legal abortions, I don't think is, is a question, because as I said in the beginning, we always have had the choice. It's always been a risky uh, set, set of affairs, as you can see with the types of abortions that there are today, the risk for the uh, baby you know, really unsafe for the baby. And the fact that these abortions are leading to the taking of the life inside, to me, should be the, the main concern. The fact that there's a Supreme Court that's going to make this decision should not really be the main concern. The main concern should be on Judgment Day when we have to stand and be judged by the Supreme Being whether or not we have, we're coming there with the uh, stain of the blood of our unborn children. Any questions? Who has a question? Um, Terry, I don't know if you have any daughters, do you? No. If you did, let's say you had a daughter that was 13 years old, mm -hmm. and she came to you and said, Mommy, I've got some bad news to tell you, I'm pregnant. Would you, uh, how would you advise her? Would you desire her to have an abortion or not. She comes to you saying, Mommy, I'm pregnant and I, I want to get rid of it. What are you going to say? Okay, so you want to know how would I handle an abortion? Even if my son came to me with a girlfriend. Yeah, but let's say your daughter. Okay, my daughter, yeah, fine, daughter. no problem. She's 13, it's an unfortunate set of events, but the baby, she has uh, an ado adoption as an alternative, which I don't even see as an alternative. In my, in my family situation. We would, she just have to have the baby, we have to make the best of it in this situation. Who else has a question? Under your argument, is birth control accessible? Oh yes, birth control is part of being responsible in the beginning. Okay, but you said from day one. There Wait a minute, birth control, there. abortion is a form of birth control? Excuse me. No, birth control, is it all right? Oh, okay. oh, oh like sorry. the IUD. Oh, sorry. Okay, because uh, the IUD. <laughs> well, the IUD is, is a form of birth control. Right. That people but lump in with the pill, the other type. Right, but the IUD is another. For me, the IUD would not be an acceptable form of birth control. Why? Why would it be? Because IUDs cause many abortions. Well, not yeah, many but abortions, saying, but they. The, yeah, the whole I'm saying you can't really draw the line because a lot of forms of birth control kill the fertilized egg. Uh, so where do you draw the line? Yes, yeah, exactly. Where do you draw the line? Are you going to have birth control police going out and checking everyone? <laughs> no. People have free will. They have to live with their own decisions, which is true. But I'm just know. saying that it's very difficult to draw the line. I don't. Well, yeah, it is, and I don't think the government should. Have saying you see how the baby is formed in three months, have you seen the pro life pin of the baby's feet at ten weeks after conception? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much.